Hello and welcome to episode six of our Sunbelt Baseball podcast with Matt and Ty. I'm Matt Stewart. There's legendary Texas State baseball coach Ty Harrington. And we're getting closer and closer to the Sunbelt tournament. Uh, what was your baseball weekend like, coach? You know, and interesting to say the least, because I didn't have anything on Friday uh, because Texas State, they did softball this past weekend. And uh, so I went to Austin and uh, University of Texas had Oklahoma State in town, got to see Saturday's game and then Saturday, Saturday, Sunday's game as well. And uh, so it was uh, a lot of radio, but fun, some good baseball on Saturday and uh, and Sunday, actually. It just depended on what side of the baseball or what color jersey you were rooting for. And uh, and so it was it was good, and uh, so I enjoyed it, and uh, I had another, and then I had a Tuesday game, I think, as well, and and uh, I know you had a great weekend or a big weekend. You were either, it was at Georgia, right, that you guys had Vanderbilt? At right? Georgia, the bull, yeah, the Bulldogs swept Vanderbilt for the first time since 2003, outscored them uh, 35 to 14, or no, I'm sorry, 35 to 11, and the amazing Charlie Condon homered. And as we sit here right now, he's homered in seven consecutive games. He has 33 home runs on the year. Uh, I think there's a really good chance he's going to blow by 40. And if Georgia stays in this thing long enough, I don't know. I don't think he can catch Pete and Cavillia, but my gosh, he's he's got a really good shot of going over 40. He's just unbelievable. He's a phenomenon. It's uh, been doing this a long time. I've never seen an individual season like this. Yeah, and I know this is some about and but t- I, tell his story a little bit more because I I started I read part of it and like I said I, one of my friends has a, knows him well and knows said, him well and he, 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 you told me he was barely recruited out of high school in that right it wasn't yeah that, right yeah so we'll dive into it real quick and then we'll get into our Sun Belt and by the way we are going to talk to Southern Miss baseball coach Christian Ostrander coming up here. In just a few minutes, the uh, Golden Eagles had a big weekend as they swept Coastal Carolina, and we'll dive into that and all the other big stories coming up here momentarily. Yeah, but Charlie Condon was not even recruited. He played at the, the Walker School in Atlanta, where I live. It's a very tiny school. It's a single-A school out of seven classifications, so you can tell it's very small. He had no offers, no offers to play baseball coming out of uh, high school. He was also a quarterback and a punter on his football team. And again, it's single A football. Uh, his, his one opportunity was to play football and baseball at Rhodes college division three school in Memphis. And so that's what he was going to do. Um, but uh travel ball coach or his high school coach, one of the other called the university of Georgia, new then head coach, Scott Strickland said, hey, man, you know, take a look at this guy. You know, all he's ever wanted to do is play for Georgia. And so they took him as a preferred walk-on. And he didn't even play his first year. They redshirted him as he got bigger and stronger in the weight room. And then last year was his redshirt freshman season. He hit 25 home runs as a redshirt freshman. And now he has 33 as a redshirt sophomore. And everybody seems to be on board with this now. He's most likely the number one pick in the MLB draft, unless somebody's just choosing something at the top where they got to have a pitcher or something like that. If he's not one, he's going to be two, so or three. I mean, he's going to be right there. But the thing that's really extraordinary about him, if you get a chance to watch him, is just the exit velocity off the bat. I mean, there are never any soft ones, man. They're all 100 plus, 110 off the bat, whether it's an infield grounder or whether it's, uh, you know, a 415-foot home run. So, yeah, he's an extra- and he's an extraordinary kid, too. I'm about as humble and conscientious and respectful as you could ever meet, almost to, like, you know, you know, yes, sir, no, sir kind of thing, and I appreciate that respect, but I'm almost like, you know, you don't have to do that <laughs> all the time that you talk to me. You can just call me Matt. That'll be fine, so. But he's a great kid. Great kid, and it's great to see him doing so well. But anyway, let's hop into the Sun Belt here. And our number one story of the week has got to be the Troy Trojans, who had won eight in a row and nearly had a sweep of Louisiana 
in Troy over the weekend. Uh, had they been able to accomplish that, they'd be tied for first right now. Uh, Louisiana was able to pull one out of the fire on wild one, too, in the finale, 14-13 to 13 in extra innings. So Louisiana comes out of the weekend, two-game lead at the top of the Sun Belt standings. Might be enough, but whether Troy ends up catching them and winning the championship or not, they've established themselves as a team to be reckoned with, not only going into the Sun Belt postseason, but also the NCAA postseason. Well, you know, I, was... I watched bits and pieces of game one and two. Um, as I was doing some work, I got I put my phone up in my booth and I'm able to go between game and game and, and as I'm doing other games as well. And then what's interesting is on the Sunday game, I'd kind of given it, well, they're going to win that game because they were up 11-5, I think, going into the night, something similar to that. And then all of a sudden, I the, the, the night's over and I'm headed home and I start scrolling through, um, I get home, I start scrolling through scores and, 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 uh, you know, just actually trying to unwind from the weekend, probably having the beers rolling through them. And all of a sudden I look at the, see the score, I'm like, oh my, it made, it made my stomach hurt both ways because you know, as a coach, <laughs> you're like, you're trying to hold down a, 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 a you know, a, a win with a six run lead and then you see it dissipate. But then, as the other side of it, if you do something like that, it's so hard to do that you, and then th- they take it back from you. And it just shows you just how fun and how crazy college baseball can truly be. And uh, particularly with, with Louisiana, who's thrown the ball so well all year. And, you know, and for some crazy things to happen to, to give up six like that late, but then they come back, show resiliency and toughness and find a way to win the game and come out of the series with one win. Yeah, I was listening to the D1 Baseball podcast with Rooney, Runes, Mike Rooney, uh, and it's funny. They called this kind of game. They weren't talking about this game, but this is what this is what they were talking about, a crab-in-the-bucket game. You know how crabs in a bucket are always climbing over each other and trying to get to the top? That 14-13 game was a crab-in-the-bucket kind of game, and Louisiana ended up being the crab that got out of the bucket, but it was like... Uh, that was a wild one, and Troy hit a grand slam in the bottom of the ninth to force extra innings, and then Louisiana gets a couple of home gets a couple of runs and extras. Connor Higgs hit a big home run for him, and uh, Troy's now ranked in the D1 baseball top twenty-five. I think first time in over a decade. They're they're twenty-one, and Louisiana's uh, twenty-two. Uh, from an RPI standpoint, Trojans are forty-seven, and Louisiana's fifty. Uh, what do you think about Louisiana and that RPI? I mean, they're still on top of the conference at the regular season. Uh, do you feel like they're okay with that RPI? I think they've got to finish strong. I do. I think they they need to, you know, you got six games left. Um, and, you know, I think if I remember right, they've got Georgia Southern. Yes, and South Alabama. They've got to be at Georgia Southern. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and Georgia Southern's been good, particularly in conference. Uh, and they've played really well at different times. And, you know, in South Alabama, you know, fighting to get in there and, and continue to – that's possible. Then let's say have a great weekend this weekend. So, uh, you know, they, they need – I think Louisiana's got to finish good. Uh, and if they do that, uh, and, and they, they put that, themselves in a position to win a regular season and then, you know, do okay. But I don't think they'd have to do a ton in the tournament. Um, but I think they'd have to do maybe something, uh, and that's only based out of past experience. And uh, right. but I, I, I think that you know I think they've got themselves obviously in a good spot. Winning the regular season of the Sun Belt will mean something. It'll carry some weight. Yeah, it's even surprising to be asking that question, but because I think you know they got a two game lead now with six to play. Uh, I think they should be able to hold that off. That you know, two games doesn't sound like a lot, but with six to play, it is a lot. Uh, but okay. Troy does have the tiebreaker for the number one seed, so we'll wait and see what happens. But Troy, no doubt, has been. And we talked to Skyler Mead last week. That team that he has, he has a he has a bunch of mashers on that team. Will Butcher and uh, Cole Myers and and uh, and Brooks Bryan, the catcher and. Kyle Mock, man, they can really smash the cover off the ball. Yeah, 
they're, they're plenty offensive. I'm at, I'm excited. I get to see them this weekend. Um, I'll have them in uh, San Marcos um, and Texas State. Now they're they're up against it, and I'm sure we'll talk about that even a little bit later. They've got to keep climbing to make sure to get into the to the Sun Belt tournament, and so those we'll see them play at high level. So I'm anxious to see Troy this weekend and what that team offensively looks like is what you're adding to, and you know Scotter was so excited you could you could just see it and hear it and that in in his voice the confidence that he's got in his players and the confidence that they have and they're playing with it i mean he not only he only not only exudes it about his players which coaches love to do anyway but you you see it and you're seeing it on the field and then even represented by the great comeback that didn't get fit you know they didn't win that last game but for them to even keep doing that um, in a game where they had a chance to sweep, where a lot of times guys get down like that on that third game, and they're like, ah, we did good. We won two. But no, 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 not that bunch. They, they kept fighting with a chance to try to sweep Louisiana, and I think it shows their personality as well. Story number two, Southern Miss uh, sweeps Coastal Carolina as the Chanticleers free fall continues. This is kind of stunning, and we'll talk about the, uh, the Golden Eagles in depth here with Coach Christian Ostrander, in just a few minutes. So we'll go in depth with those guys. But they have now won 31 games on the season. That's 22 straight seasons. They've done that, at least 30 wins. And they're tracking for more. I think they're solid, unless something terrible happens and they just collapse. And as Coach Oz will tell you, they've had some pitching issues. But, man, nobody's had pitching issues, pitching issues kind of like Coastal has. But... The Chanticleers are now 11 and 13. They're tied for 8th, 9th, and 10th with South Alabama and Georgia State. And they've got Georgia State this weekend. So that's another one of those, uh, that's a crab in the bucket series right there. So uh, we'll wait and see what happens. But the Chanticleers, a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about them maybe hosting an NCAA regional. How nervous should they be at just about getting in the NCAA, well, just getting in the Sun Belt tournament, much less the NCAA tournament? Well, yeah, I, mean, they, I think they're probably more interested in why they're not playing well as opposed to being nervous about, you know, what lies ahead of them. I think they're probably trying to figure that out. I know the pitching side of it has has been uh, of interest to them. I think that, you know, I, I, we know after talking to Gary a couple of weeks ago that they've had a ton of, you know, bad luck with injuries and different guys that have been peeled out of the uh, off their roster because of that. And they're just – Look, it's not the minor leagues. You don't you don't have guys you call up in the middle of the season to replace guys that get hurt. A lot of people don't understand that. And then a lot of people say, well, they use the next man mentality. Well, yeah, you do, right? But there's a reason why those guys were your number one and number two is going into it. And so it's sometimes incredibly difficult to overcome. Sometimes you don't overcome it. I mean, I've seen teams have been a part of teams that you just didn't. But, again, I think they're probably trying to figure out why it's – it's they've lost eight in a row. Why, why it's been that way and probably putting most of their attention towards that. And it really goes back to now the old baseball adage we coaches used to throw around our dugout and our players all the time. It's definitely one game at a time, one pitch at a time for them right now. And it just slows your players down from looking too far ahead about what you just mentioned. The what if, what if we don't, what if we, you know, let's everybody hold on, let's, let's catch our breath. And it does magnify every series. But at this point of the time of the year, anyway, every game, unless you just got yourself, you know, somewhere so solid in in an RPI perspective that you're going, hey, let's just keep playing hard, let's keep doing the same. But it just yeah, I think that's what makes the Sun Belt tournament so fun, and we'll be there in a couple of weeks. Even all these good teams that we've talked about, Louisiana, and Coastal, and Southern Miss, Georgia Southern, another we'll talk about here in just a moment. They all go there, and they're highly motivated to win. Nobody's going there saying, thinking, oh, well, we can just get a win or two and we'll be okay. I think they all go there. Nobody ever feels totally safe going, you know, even if they're having a great season, nobody ever feels totally comfortable in, in the Sun Belt Tournament. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, look, I, I agree, but, but, but there's enough, there's enough, yeah. RPI value oh, yeah. in the tournament. That if you play well and you do good, you can scoop up some value and 
and really help you start to solidify yourself and, and putting yourself from the NCAA perspective. And so that's the good thing about one, the history of the Sun Belt over the last couple of years. You, you talked about it earlier with Coach Ostrander when we were talking to him about, you know, the, the number of teams that have been in the tournament over the last couple of years and what the tournament and what the conference is like now. And, and the addition of adding Southern Miss and the value they brought with them, RPI-wise, tradition-wise, all those things, facilities, that, you know, what an, an unbelievable baseball program. And so, that, but point is that there's 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 ability to scoop up value, RPI value. Uh, in, story in number three, program. and that's James Madison. They win two out of three at home against Arkansas State. Uh, not a surprise there. Their RPI is 37. Their strength of schedule schedule is 17. The thing that surprised me in the topic I'm talking about here is in the latest NCAA baseball regional projections, which were last week, and the, they come out every Wednesday. Um, they did include James Madison. And I got to ask you from a coach's perspective, how surprising is that? And I know the projections are not gospel. And just because D1 baseball says they're not in doesn't mean they're not in. But would you be surprised at 37 and 17 with those metric numbers if they didn't get in? Um, well, we won't know. I'm not trying to right, yeah. jump the side of your question. We don't know because we don't have the full body. We don't know what these next six games do to them. You know, and, and if, they, if they take the next six games and they add that as value – and they're still at 37, and then they end the season in a positive way, and they carry that 37 into what we just talked about, the value of the tournament. Um, and they were still landed at 36, 35-ish, something like that. Yeah, I'd be surprised they were left out, So, in, in all honesty. So, I mean, I, again, I think, you know, what everybody, when you look at where everybody is today, that is exactly, but you got to remember, you, well, you know, remember, you know this as good as anybody. This is such a fluid part of the season because we've got more we when you're doing the mathematical part of an RB, RPI there's more data now there's and there's going to be even more data in the next two weeks that are going to compress those numbers and, and obviously give you where it is where if you if you do good and you keep winning you can stay where they are I would be at that point in time surprised if they keep adding value to, to their win column yeah the uh, the, the, the last D1 projections had Louisiana in, had Coastal in, had Troy in, had Southern Miss in. And here's where what James Madison battles in relation to the, all those. All those four teams that I just mentioned, they got cachet. They got, they got historical cachet. They've been there. They've done that. It's not – James Madison's going to be battling that a little bit. So they might have to do a little bit extra this year because they don't have the history, you know, not the kind of history that those four programs. Yeah, and again, on top of that, I think to do that, that it, it's all going to depend on what the six end are and what they do in the tournament to continue to catch the you know the committee's eye and make that thirty six maybe elevate it to thirty three where it gets hard. Now I've seen teams left out. I've seen teams left out in their thirties, and. You know, RPI is not the only thing that's used by the committee. And I think everybody's got to, you know, understand that part of it as well. And what you brought to life is very true. All these other programs have, you know, history on their side. They've got attendance on their side. They've got a lot of different factors that can, not always, depending who they are, can come into play from a committee perspective. And I just think they've got to continue to grab value these at the end of this. All right, rest of the Sun Belt this past weekend, Georgia Southern swept ULM 3-0, and uh, they went up eight in the RPI. They're at 70. They're still a ways away, but they do have momentum. Fifth place, App State takes two out of three at home versus South Alabama. Uh, Jags uh, got blasted 23-3 to by the Mountaineers on a Sunday doubleheader after they had won on Friday, had a rain out on Saturday. Texas State stayed afloat, taking two out of three against Old Dominion. Uh, they had a big 18-4 to run rule victory on Friday night. And, of course, the Bobcats welcome in the hottest team 
in the conference, Troy, needing to win that series uh, this coming weekend, which will be a tall task. And Georgia State just hanging on by a thread. They dropped two out of three at Marshall. And now the Panthers play at Coastal this weekend. And that could be a make-or-break series for uh, the winner and the loser of that series. I agree with you. I mean, it's a huge series for in a lot of different ways. And, you know, when you start thinking about, you know, uh, tournament implications, whether you get in, don't get in, I mean, it, it adds a little bit to it. But in the same breath, I mean, I, even as a coach, if you allow yourself to get away, you, you know that – and get ahead of yourself too far, um, you might find yourself putting yourself in a in a situation emotionally about, hey, we we got to do this, 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 it. But the reality is, six games is still a lot of baseball. It doesn't seem like it when a fifty-six game schedule. But those last six games, think about that. Think about if you won all six. Think about if Coastal went back and started playing like that. Think about if yep. Georgia State. Remember when they were playing so good? Remember, and and, and all of a sudden. You, you hit a hot streak, and you win four of those six, five of those six. Start looking what that does for your team. And uh, so, I, I, again, this weekend is going to – obviously, every weekend is going to, you know, make a difference in the, in the overall. Um, that's why it's going to be exciting this weekend. And I think you and know, I talked about it when we first started this podcast, that that last weekend, it wouldn't shock us if there's only a game or two difference between a lot of teams getting – into the tournament and a lot of, and those three teams at the top, which really right now there's about three of them that in there that, and what that might, might look like from who's going to win a regular season championship. All right. Time now to bring in Southern Miss head coach, Christian Ostrand. Coach Oz, thanks a lot for being with us. Congratulations on a three game sweep of coastal Carolina over the weekend at the Pete, uh, kind of take us through that series and, uh, what that series means for you guys as you set up for the final two weekends of the regular season and get ready for the Sun Belt Tournament. Well, it was a great weekend for us. I mean, any any time you sweep an opponent in conference play, that's so powerful and hard to do. So um, you know, but it was you know it came at a, a good time for us. Um, you know, we've um, you know I'm not saying we haven't been as consistent as we wanted to be in some of those regards, but uh, tough. Series loss the week before at Lafayette where, you know, we had a late inning home run that kind of crippled us and, and stuff. So to see the guys bounce back, and I, I, the thing that I was most proud of was we played very good baseball. And uh, it was very clean, very all clean. aspects. And, um, you know, against a great program, we got a ton of respect for. And uh, I thought we I thought we just played very good. Coach, I think, you know, when, when I came in and you guys were chatting just a little bit before I came on and – I think it's a question that people are interested in. And I know I am, and I know, you know, there's 24 hours in a day and 22 and a half of them are spent with baseball. Most people probably don't know that they've never coached before, but since you've been and you've been on the pitching side for so long and now you're the head coach. So do you keep the responsibilities pitching wise and, if so, or did you add somebody to the staff? Or what does that look like dynamic-wise for Southern Miss now on the staff? Uh, well, I definitely, you know, I, I want to be as deep as I can with the pitchers. I, I still call the game, um, you know, just, just all those things. And from the developmental side, I think that's something we've done a pretty good job here at Southern Miss, um, you know, last seven years of, uh, you know, and beyond that or before that of – uh, you know, get, bringing guys on and develop them. So we, you know, we want to continue that. And and to me, you know, we really try to use that high school model as much as we can and, and do that. But it was very important to me when I got this opportunity that I felt like that's what helped me get here. And uh, I feel like that's something that I need to continue to do. Uh, I got a great uh, assistant coach, uh, Keller Bradford, that pitched here for me in 2018 that helps me uh, with the guys. And, uh, you know, he does – he takes the – the old workload of trying to organize bullpens amongst classes and weight schedules and all that stuff, you know, so I'm, he tells me when we're going to do it and I'm always there. So uh, I try to be as visible as I can and, and be, be the, the, the voice for him as much as I can, as well as, you know, the rest of the team. And uh, it takes some finagling with your schedule, um, your practice plan. It makes for some long days, but it is what it is. I think it's important. You, you know, it's a guy that, that was, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, no I'm just going to follow up. Do you peek over to the offensive side, or how does that how does that work with you now? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I'm, I, I trust my, my hitting guys, and, and uh, but I also want to have a say. I want to have a voice in that, too. I, I think that's important. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of uh, communication and, and things of that nature. I let them do their things, but, uh, you know, I – there are things that I want to make sure that we're, you know, our standards are, you know, the voice is, you know, very, there's a lot of passion about certain things. And, uh, and I love that part of it. I feel like as a pitching coach, you, you kind of learn a little bit about hitting too, you know, in a lot of respect, cause you're trying to get them guys out and um, you know, and it's, you kind of have a, a perspective, I guess, from an offensive standpoint as well. And, uh, but, but no, I, like I said, I'm not a micromanager. I let our guys coach, but I want to be involved and, um, I'm, a, I'm big on the mental side and motivational side of things. And uh, so I think, you know, that presence and voice is important. Uh, as a guy that is now the head coach but has been a pitching coach, that's your background. Kind of take me through the evolution of the pitch game in college baseball now that the catchers have earpieces and the pitchers can hear the call and you got armbands and the old, uh, the old way of uh, flashing the signals in from the dugout to the catcher, catcher to the pitcher and all that. That's all changed. How has that, you know, how has that impacted you as you've had to change with the game? As has every pitch coach in America has had to change with that game? Yeah, it's uh, you know I'm doing sure. things now I thought I'd never do. Uh, you know <laughs> I can remember twenty something years ago. Uh, you know my, my first stint as Division One pitching coach. Um, you know we're just you know touching noses and ears and relaying signs and getting exactly. in and you know, whatever and. And then, then those wristband things started happening, which I said, you know what, I'm never going to do that. Well, I did. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and then the, the new technology comes up with, you know, uh, the things. And I said, no, we don't need that. Well, we got it. And, you know, and, and honestly, now we're at a point, you know, between the talking to your catcher, between the pitch com where they can hear you or the, or the you know, the, the signals on the, the, the band there. I like it. Um, it, it speeds things up. It, it takes things out of the equation, worried about signs being stolen from second base and stuff. Um, it's simplified. It's simplified. Uh, I, you know, so I'm not a – I was stubborn, you know, to want to wanna go to it. But now that we're in it, it's, you know, it's not bad. The, let me ask you this because this is just a personal observation. Observation. I'm about your opinion on this. your opinion on this. Do you – with TrackMan – and now with umpires and, you know, being able to be graded by track man, seeing the track man, have you seen a difference in the strike zone? Do you think it's a smaller strike zone? Do you think it's the same? What What are your thoughts, if any, from it? From well, it? You know, well, I do. I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's definitely changed it some. I, I You know, I don't, I think those umpires have a hard job, you know. I yep. think we're always going to be, you um, you know, very subjective of whatever they call. And uh, as long as it's both ways, I'm great with it. You know, whatever your zone is. But I do think now with the technology and the grade and stuff, I think it's less liberal uh, a little bit. Um, But I I think they're doing a good job because there's times where I'm, you know, my mind, I'm going, man, this dude, he's tight, man. And then I go back and I look, go, well, (laughs) he's pretty good. You know, so um, I don't know. I think there, I think because of the, of the new, uh, technology that can, you know, evaluate those. Um, evaluate I think they're those trying to do a better job too. And uh, so, you know, I don't know. Uh, I know walks are up, but maybe walks are up because there's less pitching being taught. I don't know, you know, and, and stuff, which I think there's a lot of that, you know, you know, uh, get stuff and let them throw and, you know, shoot for the middle and uh, versus the old school way of, you know, just sinking it and, just and, just and, and moving the ball to all quadrants. So, it's probably a combination. Probably a combination. Let me ask you about some of your guys. Let's start with your starting rotation. Billy Oldham has been huge for you guys. And we do a thing at the end of the podcast every week where we name our starting nine and our starting rotation from the weekend. And, you know, Billy seems like he's in, in our starting rotation, our Sunbelt rotation every weekend. He will be again this week. Nico Mazza has been on that list. Mm-hmm. And Will Armistead also. All three of your guys at some point has – you know, have made that list for us as starting pitchers. And uh, how do you feel about your rotation on the weekends? 
Well, I feel good about it. I mean, we lost Will Armistead. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, you know, so him being I thought you might have. I, I saw that you said Yeah, spot uh, unfortunately, things. man, he just had, uh, you know, that, that elbow got to him, and I uh, hated that form. So, you know, really right now I got two starters, you know. I'm not sugarcoating it. That's that's kind of what we have. And, I, and, and Billy and Nico, you know, uh, these last two weekends when it all went down, I told them, I said, hey, guys, you're going to throw 100 plus pitches. You're going to work out your own mess. We got to, you got to carry, you know, some distance. And they've done a remarkable job the back-to-back -back weekends uh, of doing that. But, uh, uh, you know, both of them has been in the fire. They were in it last year. Uh, you know, both of them started super regional games. Uh, both of them started regional games, you know, and, and conference, cha you know, championship, whatever. I mean, so they've been in the moment. So I, I, I you know, to me, they're, they're not sped up, you know, and, and so forth, but, and they've grown. I mean, I think they, they've grown and they're, they're doing what, you know, uh, what you, what you hope to have in your rotation. Some guys, you feel like, you know, what you're going to get. And that's all I can ask for. Ty, let me jump in there and ask him about his bullpen too. Sibley and Allen have been big for you. They have, uh, you know, we, we lost a piece with uh, McCarty English, a freshman arm that was really, really looking great, having a great freshman campaign. Uh, had a stress fracture in his arm, and uh, so we had to we had to shoot him down for a little bit. And uh, you know, so there were some pieces there that 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 kind of hurt. And you know, but but between Colby and Cross, I think they've combined for about a hundred innings out of the bullpen, and uh, been very reliable. We've kind of found some good rhythm, you know, handing it off from. You know, they're different looks, they're different uh, stuff. And uh, so you go from like Billy to Cross. I mean, they're so different. You're preparing for such a different thing. And even Nico with the riding 95 mile an hour heater to Colby with, you know, good sink and slider. Um, so those guys have been done a great job amongst others as well. Coach, when you're looking at on, on that, I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit. When you're sitting down on Thursday night of, of a series and you look at the team you're playing, uh, when you talk about piggybacking, is it important for you to to go from an offset of maybe taking a 95 mile an hour fastball and a foot difference between the next guy, you know, left-handed rhythm wise change up. Is that more important to you or the lineup of the other team, whether it's a right left matchup or whatever that might be, do you ride on what you feel like your guys do better or what the other lineup calls for a combination of all the above with those two we just talked about probably not you know i'm not I, i'm gonna let them do what they need to do because i think they have a way to get the lefty or righty out you know and so forth but for others yes i mean there's others that you kind of know hey uh so and so doesn't need to pitch you know in in this segment here or whatever it's just not a good matchup and stuff so and we have enough variation between chandler best another lefty uh that's been very successful against both lefties and righties and uh you know, and, and it's a couple right-handers that uh, have success against lefties, but then we have some that just need to face righties and stuff. So, uh, but, you know, kind of for my bread and butter guys, you know, the ones I'm handing it off too late, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to let, let, you know, they're my guys. I'm going to let it ride with them. Let me talk about some of your bats here. Dalton McIntyre has been your uh, top hitter all year. He's, up, he's at 384 right now, leads the team in hits, leads the team in on-base percentage. You know, Slade Wilkes, no big surprise. He's been your power hitter. Carson Pato's had a good year. Ozzie Pratt, your shortstop's been really good. And uh, Gabe Broadus, last couple of weeks, man, this guy's come up with clutch hit after clutch hit for you. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's, uh, it's a new offense. You know, we have three bats returning from last year um, between Wilkes, Pato, and Monastere. And they've done a good job. And uh, so the new pieces, it's been fun to watch them grow. Um, you know, obviously, Ozzy Pratt, he, he played the last two years at BYU, so he, he's got Division One experience. But, you know, between McIntyre and Broadus and uh, Gillespie, this is their first, you know, and, and to watch their growth from beginning to now, it's, it's been very, very fun to watch and encouraging. So, um, you know, when we're, when we're clicking well, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a long lineup. I really do. Um, you know, just like any, you know, there's times where you get real frustrated, go like, you know, why can't we hit, you know, and so forth. But uh, I, I think the growth and what our hitting coaches uh, have done with them has, has been great. And uh, I like kind of where we're at, you know, with that. And I feel like we found some good rhythm. Coach, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to peel off of the, the team part of it for a second. And this is just a curious question. Um, I probably know the answer to it, but the people listening and watching may not. I mean, you were a junior college head coach. 
and uh, you, you spent some time in the junior college ranks, how much do you think that that's played a part in you sitting in the chair you're at today and the mindset that you have and the abilities you've had to coach as not only pitchers, but now a whole team and an organization? I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't have those years there, 100%. I, that's where I found myself. Uh, that's where I think I found my voice, uh, you know, and my kind of identity. You know, just kind of all the 10 years of uh, being an assistant, you know, and, and with some great programs, Delta State, and, and I was at Arkansas State for four years, and, and you know, and just kind of young coach figuring things out. And, um, you know, and then once I got that opportunity to, to lead a team, you know, and, man, I'm calling pitches, I'm in the third base box, I was having a blast, you know, and, uh, you know, so I, I just, I don't know, I started just really felt like I, I grew a lot in uh, – and I think once I got in that third base box, I think I became a better pitching coach too, because you think from an offensive perspective with, with things as well. So, um, you know, my route's been kind of weird, you know, um, I, you know, started off at Delta state for six years, um, uh, you know, my, where I played at and, uh, man, just cutting my teeth, grinding it out with coach Mike Kennison, one of the best coaches out there, um, you know, learned so much. Then I go to Arkansas state. I was with Keith Kessinger who had, uh, a lot of a pro pro side, pro flair, pro mentality to it, which I learned some things that I haven't heard at Delta State. And then then I go to high school for two years. I'm a head, I'm a head high school coach for two years before I go to Jones. And uh, so two years as a high school coach, eight years at Jones as a head coach. And then, you know, kind of got conviction, man, if I, you know, I want to see if I can do it at the, the big boy level and um, had a chance to go to Louisiana Tech, you know, in, in the, you know, the fall of 15. And uh, made that decision, did it, and there a couple years, and been here ever since. So very thankful, you know. And uh, but I've been shaped by all my stops, no doubt about it. But that JUCO part, man, that was fun. You could just coach, you know, and and really impact the kids' lives a lot too. Yeah, you were with Coach Barry, who remains with the university. And as you, as we were talking about and joking about before we started our conversation, you know, he's around every day as a role with the with the school, and that's great. Yeah, uh, I think you're like one of only four coaches for Southern Miss in the last 50 years. I mean, when they get the job, they keep the job. I mean, it, I, there's, I don't think there's any other program in America that, you know, could brag of that kind of stability. Uh, and I just read you guys are 30 wins again this year, uh, 22 consecutive seasons. It's the longest streak in Division One baseball. What's it like to be the head coach at a place where baseball is so important, where it's such a big sport on campus, where it means a lot to the school and to the community and to the fans? Well, it's an honor first. I mean, I'm, I'm extremely humbled to, to, to be this. You know, for Coach Barry, uh, seeing me to be his successor meant success. the world to me. I mean, that's, you know, that was uh, as high as it gets for me. And uh, but I know the responsibility uh, with it, and I like that, man. I, you know, at the point I'm at in my career, um, you know, I wouldn't really want to go to a rebuilding this and that. I'm at a place. This is where I want to be, and it was, uh, and and a lot of easy decisions to stay here, I guess you could say. And um, but this is a special place, uh, you know. What started with uh, Pete Taylor, you know, who the park's named after, then to Hill Denson. And, uh, you know, Hills, you know, he's a legend, you know, and he's he sits in the office, you know, he comes by, you know, and then, you know, uh, the late coach Corky Palmer, you know, what a great man, and, you know, and, and um, enjoyed the years with him when he was here and still being involved and then coach Barry. So, you know, how I got this thing, man, beyond me, but uh, I'm very thankful and, and it's an honor to follow the lines of those great men. But uh you know, this job is unique, I think. I think the community involvement is so strong. Um, we got a great fan base. Um, the expectations are sky high, but that's what you want. I mean, you know, you want people to care. You want them to care when you win. You want them to care when you lose and uh, stuff, and that's fine. You know, that's that's part of the job. And to me, they give me my opportunity. I'm going to do everything I can to try to keep this university and this program where it's at or take it even further, whatever that means. Coach, last for me, what do you think you guys got to do if you, you know, obviously to win the tournament always puts you in and all that, you know, and from some belt perspective, you got two weekends left. 
you get down this part of the year, everybody's tough, right? Every weekend is huge. Everybody, you start looking at your calendar and your schedule and you go, oh my God, we got to do this, this. And then, and then those last two weeks show up in the tournament. But from your perspective, what do you think you guys got to do moving forward from this day forward, headed into the last two weekends in the postseason to get yourself in the right shape to make it to the NCAAs? Uh, we we got to keep pitching to baseball. Uh, yep. Because our depth, our margin for error is not not great. We got to, we need good starts out, out of those first two guys, um, and then I need a few guys to step up. The, the ability's there. I've seen it. I mean, the ability's there. Uh, they need to allow it to happen sometimes and and stuff. And that's part of growth. And uh, you know, with it. But you know, uh, I think offensively we can compete uh, with with you know with anything that we come up against, and I think we can do it. Uh, we can compete with anybody's offense as well from the mound perspective. We just need to go, continue to go out there and do it because, like I said, our margin for errors is, is not great uh, with our numbers and bodies. But, uh, you know, this group's really come a long way, man. They've uh, they've stayed together and competed well, even on some tough, you know, I remember like that Georgia State week, and we got our teeth kicked in on a Friday and Saturday. I mean, just – and uh, and then on Sunday we're down 6-1 after three innings. And our dudes kept fighting. And they didn't quit, and they came back and won that game. To me, that was a very pivotal moment for this group, and them, you know, just a building block and uh, and stuff. So um, I like I like the chemistry and attitude right now. It feels right. Things are, you know, I feel like I've been able to I've step out of the circle a little bit. And go. I'll say the thing, same thing to you that I said to Gilly a couple of weeks ago. You guys have just been huge for the Sun Belt, just as Coastal was. And, you know, over the last decade, Coastal, Southern Miss, Georgia Southern even, have been added to the mix. And you had the old mainstays, Troy. And Troy's, of course, maybe the hottest team in the conference right now. And Louisiana, of course, the Raging Cajuns have been on top the entire season. But uh, you guys have been instrumental in turning this conference, baseball-wise, into a league that, you know, last year got four year before got four, this year should get four. It's pretty amazing stuff. Y'all have had a big role in all of that, not just benefiting your own program, but benefiting all the programs in the conference. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, it was, uh, this is a good league. Uh, you know, we, we were in that Conference USA for so long, and, and, and there was years you would have some of those four, not many, you know. Um, it was usually a two-horse race or something like that, you know, especially for the, uh, you know, the, the regionals and stuff. But uh, this one, this feels like this should last a while, you know, uh, of where and, and, who, and maybe that's more than four, you know, at some point. And I believe that could happen too, um, you know. So I think it's a great league. I think there's some unbelievable coaches and I uh, still haven't met every one of them yet, you know, in, in person. But uh, just a lot of respect. You got to show up and play, man. If, if you don't you don't play well, you're going to get beat. So that's just kind of the nature of this league. Coach Oz, thanks a lot for being with us, and good luck the rest of the season. Look forward to talking to you at the Sun Belt Tournament. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you all having me. Coach, best of luck. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. All right, Coach. Appreciate it. Great to visit with Coach Oz, and he's having a great first season there with the Golden Eagles, Coach. Uh, let's take a look at our starting nine for the week. And again, Troy, and they keep bringing guys to the table here on this starting lineup. Uh, we'll start with catcher Brooks, Brian, 5 for 11, double homer, 4 RBI, 4 runs scored. First baseman, Will Butcher of Troy, 4 for 13, double, 3 home runs and 10 RBI, 5 runs scored. Uh, Chase Moore from Texas State, first time he's been on the list this season after having a fabulous freshman season the second baseman went four for 12 a couple of homers five rbi four runs scored the shortstop kyle debarge of louisiana he's every week now at the six for 15 three doubles two home runs six rbi five runs scored in the third baseman will mize georgia state he's been on this list before four for 15 a triple two homers six rbi four runs scored you go look at the run value of Will Butcher and the week he had, you, you, you know, that's a 15 run of uh, RBI, or, or, I'm sorry, 15 run value he added in there with the 10 RBIs and him being part of it, obviously, 
with the homers, <laughs> but him scoring five runs, when you start looking at that and what that represents and him driving himself in a couple of times, but that's for some people that's a month and, or, you know, three or four weekends and what he was able to do in one weekend and a huge weekend. And again, at, you know, against a pitching staff with Louisiana that has been pretty stingy, you know, and particularly early in the year, we're really stingy. And so, and it, you know, was leading in, in a lot of different categories pitching wise. And so obviously I'm going to be, a, this is just a great, you know, stater of the obvious. I mean, what an incredible weekend when you're able to, to do that against, you know, a Louisiana, a really good Louisiana team. And he made the list last weekend when they swept Coastal Carolina. So uh, let's look at our outfielders and our DH Banks Tolly of App State. And this guy's just having a phenomenal season. Hit three more home runs, gives him 21. He's blown by the program record. Uh, seven for 12 for the week weekend. Eight RBI, four runs scored. Matt Ruiz, uh, Georgia State, a guy that was playing shortstop. They've moved him to the outfield. They flip-flopped uh, him with... Uh, the center fielder, they've slip flopped there, and he went 4 for 14, three home runs himself, eight RBI, three runs scored. Davis Gillespie of Southern Miss went five for nine, three doubles, four RBI, two runs scored. And the DH is Kyle Mock Troy. He went seven for 11, a couple of doubles, a couple of home runs, nine RBI, and four runs scored. And to your point, Troy just stacking up runs. Part adding this up, you know, between the three guys you have on here from Troy, I, I mean, you're looking at 19, 23 RBIs between the three of them. And again, against a really, you know, I'm going to say it again, a really good Louisiana team. And when you look at this from, you know, a, a, for Kyle Mock, it, I mean, that's a, that's a nine RBI, two of them being himself. That's a, you know, you know, what that means and, you know, for run value and from one individual. And usually, like I said, if you would have added two of those, maybe it would have been a whole team, you know, oftentimes on a weekend. But um, you, you've talked about it before, and this is not the first time it's come up. You've been – actually, you've been on talking about this for the last three weeks, how Troy kept trending this way and how offensively they were. And then for them to show it again against this past weekend um, – shows that they're trending in the right direction. Yeah, I think they finished with 37 runs, 36, 37 runs in that series against the Raging Gages. And we've had series where teams didn't score double digits for the entire weekend against the Raging Cajuns, and they just blasted them. It's got to be a scary thought for uh, head coaches as Troy gets ready to head down to Montgomery for, or over to Montgomery. They're the closest team to Montgomery uh, for the tournament, so. Uh, starting rotation, Bryce Blevins, Marshall. Uh, they're probably not going to make the tournament. We're not going to get a chance to see him, but he's had a heck of a season. Got a win, seven innings, one run, four hits, one walk, 11 strikeouts. Dante Chirico, App State. Uh, got a win, seven innings, two runs, one earned, one hit, two walks, seven strikeouts. Billy Oldham again, Southern Miss. Got to win seven innings, two runs, four hits, two walks, 11 strikeouts. Let's start with, with Blevins because I had a chance to watch him a couple times on uh, ESPN Plus, and he is good. I know I don't know if we're going to get to see him in the tournament or not, and, and you know, whether his, his name will come back up again on your list this year or not. Maybe at the end of the year when we get done with, it, with everything and you and I get a chance to sit back down and kind of wrap it up. Uh, as possible, but he has had a, a good year, and I've seen him throw at different times and throw the ball well. And then, you know, Billy Odom, you've we've we've heard his name, and he's been he's been good for them for a while. And you'll get a chance to listen to Coach Ostrander talk about him in just a little bit as well. And uh, you know, for Trico, I mean, for him to throw good, at, South Alabama is playing with some urgency right now, and for him to go in there and do seven innings and give up one hit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's, you know, obviously it states itself and is the, the type of outing that he had. Uh, I noticed that there's a, a, a trend in that and that all of them got to seven innings. You know, all these guys now are at that point where they can go to 110 to 125 if needed. Um, if you're really trying to 
press the button to from to for postseason, either NCAA or just to get in to the Sun Belt. You're at that point where these guys are going deep, and you know sometimes you don't want to get to your bullpen. You know, and then and then this past weekend there were a lot of games that removed the double headers because of weather. And when it's when you play double headers, you allow your starters. You want your starters. You allow them to stay out there because you'll stress your bullpen in a double header in a hurry. Guys, you throw in game one historically aren't able to come back in game two and be as productive. Yeah, that's what happened with Tarico. He ended up having to pitch the front end of a double header on Sunday, and he was, uh, you know, he was just absolutely uh, fabulous. And as we heard Coach Oz say with Oldham, uh, with Armistead going down. I mean, he's got two starters. It's Oldham and, and Maza. And he's already told him, look, guys, you're going to have to pitch more. you gotta, you got to throw more pitches. You're going to have to go longer here because, you know, we're taxed. We've lost a starter. We've lost a weekend starter. So you can expect to see his name keep popping up. So interesting. He might even have a chance to be a, uh, uh, you know, uh, pitcher of the year candidate here. For the, for the entire Sun Belt. And our bullpen got a couple of guys from the Georgia Southern Eagles from their series. Uh, Mitchell Gross, two appearances, picked up a save, three and a third, no runs, two hits, no walks, four strikeouts. Jacob Phillips really covered a lot of innings for him. One appearance, got a win, six and two thirds. That's that's like a start. He had a start out of the bullpen. Gave up one did, run, four he? hits, one walk. And four strikeouts. And T.R. Williams from James Madison, first time we've had him on the list. He got a he got a win, four innings, no runs, one hit, one walk, and eight strikeouts out of the pen for him. Get your bullpen. I, I know you know starting pitching is so critical and so important. And if, you know everybody those last nine outs. If you're just saying you know six innings or seven innings, whatever it may be, those last nine outs are. Obviously, it's critical as a first out, but they seem to have a big magnifying glass on them, particularly when you use what you probably think are your best guy or should be your best guy when you're starting them in those bullpens. Now, not to go six and two-thirds inning as Phillips did and uh, to come out of there with a win, but um, it may be now that Coach may be looking at going, well, maybe we need to start him on Sunday or do we just keep him where he is because he was so good out of the pen for him. <laughs> Well, that's what that's what I love about the college game. I mean, the pro game. I mean, look, hey, look, I love Major League Baseball. Who doesn't love Major League Baseball? But you know, the bullpens are so well defined. You're you're going to be you're, well. We got our middle guy, our long guy, if we need him, and then but we but the seventh, eighth, and ninth are taken. These these you know, you're the seventh inning guy. You're the eighth inning guy. You're the ninth inning guy. You're the closer. College baseball. A lot of teams just don't have closers. They have stoppers. And they have their number one guy out of the bullpen. And it might not be the ninth. It might be the fifth that he comes into the game when they need him. That's what I love about it. It is definitely different. I don't even, you know, and now, well, you know, you know, when pro baseball becomes college baseball in the playoffs. In the playoffs, it does, yeah. Right. Because college, (laughs) remember now, college baseball is like fourth and one. So, or, or third and three every game. You, I mean, in football, I'm just using that as a reference. Where in professional right. baseball, there's 162 games. They don't, they don't get, you know, they're like, well, we're, we got a long ways. It's a long, you know. But then all of a sudden, the playoffs get here, and you see a guy have to bunt for the first time. Or you see a guy have to, you know, or you'll see a, a reliever come in, you know, back to back to back. Or a starter roll back on short rest and then try to get three innings out of you when you get into playoff baseball. So, I love pro baseball too, but to me, it becomes more like college baseball or more like what we're used to once they get to the playoffs. That's a great point. Excellent point. All right. Before we go, the top series this weekend, at least in my mind, here are the two top series this weekend. Just give us a little nugget, your thoughts on on these two series. Louisiana is at Georgia Southern. Eagles have surged up to a tie for third with Southern Miss. They're 15-9 and in the conference. Georgia State is at Coastal Carolina. And, of course, those guys are fighting for their lives. The fourth one with Louisiana, Georgia Southern, yes. I think it's huge because you got the Georgia Southern team that's playing pretty good. And, you know, like a lot of teams, they've gone up and down. But they're they're playing well right now. Um, And, you know, Louisiana to have to go on the road again and take their, their show on the road and they're still trying to protect what they have. 
um, is going to be a challenge. I think it's going to be exciting. I think it's going to be great baseball. I think it's, you're right. I think it's going to be one of the highlight series because, you know, what? Well, let's just play hypothetical. What does happen if Georgia Southern, you know, takes two or three and or, you know, whatever it may be, and they have a, a, and win the series and things get even. Remember we talked about it. You know, it compresses. It gets even tighter at the top if that happens. And they're playing well enough that they could. I mean, Louisiana goes in and up, play good. It very easily could happen. And then, well, not very easily, but could happen. And then when you look at Georgia State Coastal and talking about the implications of both those teams and what it means, number one, for them to get, you know, postseason-wise into the Sun Belt Tournament and have an opportunity to, to you know, win the tournament. And for Coastal, you know, and still they're, you know, I mean, their RPI's not that far out of there. I mean, they're just, you know, but the, you get again. You got those six games, and how critical is that going to be for them uh, moving in for the last two weekends? And then one more series. I, I think, I think Troy and Texas State is a big because Texas State's State. fighting to get into the to the ter- the Sun Belt yes. tournament right now. If it ended today, which it is not, it is not. And again, I go back to six games. A lot of baseball games left with so much value on each of them. Um, if it was the end of day, they wouldn't be in. So they're they're going to be playing with their hair on fire. They're going to be playing with all hands on deck and all the above. And Troy the same way. Troy believes they got a chance no, not, not only to help secure themselves from an RPI perspective, but they're trying to – they're chasing Louisiana thinking, hey, we we just come out of a great weekend with them. Let, let's go see if we can chase them down. So I, I do – I think that's another series to add to it as well. Yeah, you rhetorically asked what happens if Georgia Southern – you know, takes care of Louisiana. Skylar Mead sends Rodney Hennon uh, a gift card to Buffalo Wild Wings or something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, might be, <laughs> it might be Buffalo Wild Wings and more or wherever it might be. And, and uh, but yeah, I mean, I just uh, think of it, Buffalo it, Wild Wings because, like, uh, during baseball season, that's just kind of because, you know, baseball no, no, games. I'm in, I'm they end so late, you got to find a place that's still open. And that's I'm guilty. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I mean, I'm, 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 hey, look, there's nothing, the there's nothing wrong still with a, open. yeah, there's nothing wrong with a bucket of beer in front of you and, and some wings right there, and you're finishing watching games, or you got the, you know, <laughs> yeah. ESPN Plus on your phone while you're watching it and watching the big league games. No doubt. Right that, that don't no make doubt. you a bad guy. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. That makes it fun. Coach, enjoyed it. Look forward to doing this again next week. We're running out of Mondays. And that's what's making it even that much more exciting. Absolutely.